Hi, my name is Jack Herb from an organization called Hemp, and uh, which is Help Eliminate or End Marijuana Prohibition. We're going to show you a movie called Hemp for Victory that was made by the United States Department of Agriculture in 1942 for encouraging the war effort to grow 350,000 acres of cannabis, of hemp, of marijuana, cannabis sativa, over the next, each year, for the next three years for the war. More than they had grown in the preceding 50 years in the United States combined, mostly importing their hemp from uh, the Far East and Russia. While this movie is on, you may not realize that hemp was the most important product in America and in the world for thousands of years. All commerce was carried by hemp and sales. Indeed, the word canvas, as you'll see in the movie, comes from the Arabic word and the Dutch word for uh, hemp, which is canvas. Canvas is the Dutch pronunciation of cannabis. The movie you're about to see, for the last 20 years, the United States government says that no such movie was ever made by any department of the United States government. That um, we know that from at least 1981 on, that reporters for magazines, newspapers, have been told, and you'll see, a, you'll see a actual letters denying that this movie was ever made by any department of the United States Department of Agriculture or by any department of the government. Uh, Carl Packard, Maria Farrow, and myself, Jack Herr, uh, after going all through the U.S. Department of Agriculture Library at Beltsville, Maryland, in the May, uh, April and May of 1989, went to the Library of Congress, motion pictures and film strips, to see if we could find any documentation that this movie, that the newspapers were telling me that I was, they couldn't run as being affirmed by the government that the government said that they'd never made this movie that I was showing to television reporters and there were other people, activists all over the country who were showing this movie and were being told that this movie was never made by the United States government. Yeah. Uh, Carl, Marie and I went into the Library of Congress through the motion pictures and film strips and we did a search with their librarians as we had done at the Department of Agriculture Library in, in Beltsville. And we found no trace of this movie in their electronic searches, in their catalogs, or in any of their card files. And we were convinced that even though we believed the movie was totally genuine, that there was no record and that these people weren't deliberately lying, they just didn't have, somehow, somewhere it had been omitted. Finally, as we were about to leave the building after leaving the, the room where the film strips and motion pictures were housed, we thought, well, well, let's go back and give it another try. And we asked the uh, Mrs. Catherine Longby, I believe her name is, the librarian to assist us again. We said, what if we had come here 30 or 40? We didn't really know what we were going to say when we got back into that room. We said, what if we had come here 30 or 40 years ago and in the 1940s or 50s and asked for the movie Hemp for Victory? You would have gone to the electronic searches or the current catalogs or any of the other things that you've used today, the card catalogs to file, where, where would those catalogs be? Do you throw them away? And she says, no, they're over by the copy. We keep all the old catalogs, and you can go over there and, and look. But um, if they would have been here, they would have showed up on the, if it would have been in any of those books, it would have shown up already today in our searches. Now I'd like to show you a typical letter that was sent out denying that this movie was made by the United States Department of Agriculture or any other division of the United States government. Listen to it. To Mr. Jim Evans. Dear Mr. Evans, this is now this is from the United States Department of Agriculture, the Oregon State Office, uh, from John Val Calcar, the information officer. Dear Mr. Evans, we contacted the Washington, D.C. Office of the Department of Agriculture and also the Federal Audio Center and, and have been unable to locate any film with the title Hemp for Victory that was produced by any department of the federal government. Now you're reading the certification by the Photo Duplication Service from the Chief of Photo Duplication Service of the Library of Congress. And it said that there is now in the collections of the Library of Congress a publication entitled The National Union Catalog, Volume 28, Motion Pictures and Film Strips, 1953 through 1957. I further certify that the attached photocopies are true copies of title page and page 367. 
and in testimony whereof I hereunto subscribe my name and cause my seal of the Library of Congress to be affixed, which you can see, ladies and gentlemen. Next, you see the front page, the National Union Catalog, the uh, title page, 1953 to 57, volume 28, where we discovered Hemp for Victory, motion picture, U.S. Department of Agriculture, 1942. 14 minutes, black and white, 16 millimeter. And then summary explains that the war cut off the supply of East Indian coarse fibers and stresses the need for American-grown hemp for military and civilian uses. Portrays farm practices of hemp growers in Kentucky and Wisconsin. And this went out to, um, in supposedly, into the archives under Hemp U.S., uh, also to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They give you their number there, U.S. De Office of Education and Visual Education Service, all of which this disappeared from. Next, we have the certification from the same Chief of Photo Duplication Service of the Library Congress that there's now in the collections of the Library Congress a publication entitled Educational Film Guide, Annual Edition, 1945. I further certified that the attached photocopies are two copies of the title page, the reverse title page, and page 331. In testimony whereof, I hereunto subscribe my name and cause the seal of the Library of Congress to be affixed this 12th of July, 1989. And now, as you can see on page 331, under 677.7, hemp, twine and knots, is hemp for victory, 14 minute, 16 millimeter. And um, it says here, a USDA production shows how the war cut off our supply of East Indian coarse fibers and the urgent need for American-grown hemp for our Army and Navy as well as civilian use. Portrays farm practices of hemp growers in Kentucky and Wisconsin. The proof now is that this movie does really exist. Now, the government for years have been telling all of our media that this movie didn't exist and all of our activists were being impugned on their integrity. We think, uh, let the movie speak for itself. You'll please watch all 14 minutes of this film because every bit of it is memorable. Right up to when you see the parachute webbing that George Bush jumped out of the, over the Pacific with was made out of marijuana that saved the poor boy's life. temples were new, hemp was already old in the service of mankind. For thousands of years even then, this plant had been grown for cordage and coarse cloth in China and elsewhere in the East. For centuries prior to about 1850, all the ships that sailed the western seas were rigged with hemp and rope and sails. For the sailor, no less than the hangman, hemp was indispensable. A 44-gun frigate, like our cherished old Ironsides, took over 60 tons of hemp for rigging. Including an anchor cable 25 inches in circumference. The Conestoga wagons and prairie schooners of pioneer days were covered with hemp and canvas. Indeed, the very word canvas comes from the Arabic word for hemp. In those days, hemp was an important crop in Kentucky and Missouri. Then came cheaper imported fibers for cordage, like jute, sisal, and manila hemp, and the culture of hemp in America declined. But now, with Philippine and East Indian sources of hemp in the hands of the Japanese, and shipment of jute from India curtailed, American hemp must meet the needs of our Army and Navy as well as of our industries. In 1942, patriotic farmers at the government's request planted 36,000 acres of seed hemp, an increase of several thousand percent. The goal for 1943 is 50,000 acres of seed hemp. 
In Kentucky, much of the seed hemp acreage is on river bottom land such as this, along the Kentucky River Gorge. Some of these fields are inaccessible except by boat. Thus, plans are afoot for a great expansion of the hemp industry as a part of the war program. This film is designed to tell farmers how to handle this ancient crop, now little known outside Kentucky and Wisconsin. This is hemp seed. Be careful how you use it. For to grow hemp legally, you must have a federal registration and tax stamp. This is provided for in your contract. Ask your AAA committee man or your county agent about it. Don't forget, hemp demands a rich, well-drained soil such as is found here in the bluegrass region of Kentucky or in central Wisconsin. It must be loose and rich in organic matter. Poor soils won't do. Soil that will grow good corn will usually grow hemp. Hemp is not hard on the soil. In Kentucky, it has been grown for several years on the same ground, though this practice is not recommended. A dense and shady crop, hemp tends to choke out weeds. Here's a Canada thistle that couldn't stand the competition. Dead as a dodo. Thus, hemp leaves the ground in good condition for the following crop. For fiber, hemp should be sown five pecks to the acre. With drill, the closer the rows, the better. These rows are spaced about four inches. This hemp has been broadcast. Either way, it should be sown thick enough to grow a slender stalk. Here's an ideal stand, the right height to be harvested easily, thick enough to grow slender stalks that are easy to cut and process. Stalks like these here on the left, they yield the most fiber and the best. Those on the right are too coarse and woody. For seed, hemp is planted in hills like corn, sometimes by hand. Hemp is a dioecious plant. The female flower is inconspicuous, but the male flower is easily spotted. In seed production, after the pollen has been shed, these male plants are cut out. These are the seeds on a female plant. Hemp for fiber is ready to harvest when the pollen is shedding and the leaves are falling. In Kentucky, hemp harvest comes in August. Here, the old standby has been the self-rake reaper, which has been used for a generation or more. Hemp grows so luxuriantly in Kentucky that harvesting is sometimes difficult, which may account for the popularity of the self-rake with its lateral stroke. A modified rice binder has been used to some extent. This machine works well in average hemp. Recently, the improved hemp harvester, used for many years in Wisconsin, has been introduced in Kentucky. This machine spreads the hemp in a continuous swath. It is a far cry from this fast and efficient modern harvester to the Armstrong model of yore. But here's one kind of harvester, at least, that doesn't stall in the heaviest hemp. In Kentucky, hand cutting is practiced in opening fields for the machines. In Kentucky, hemp is shucked as soon as safe after cutting to be spread out for retting later in the fall. Wisconsin, hemp is harvested in September. Here, the hemp harvester with automatic spreader is standard equipment. Note how smoothly the rotating apron lays the swaths preparatory to retting. Here, it is a common and essential practice to leave headlands around hemp fields. These strips may be planted to other crops, preferably small grain. Thus, the harvester has room to make its first round without preparatory hand cutting. Here, the machine is running over corn stubble. When the cutter bar is much shorter than the hemp is tall, overlapping occurs. Not so good for retting. The standard cut is eight to nine feet. 
The length of time hemp is left on the ground to rest depends on the weather. The swaths must be turned to get a uniform rest. When the woody core breaks away readily, like this, the hemp is about ready to take up and bind into bundles. Well-retted hemp is light to dark gray. The fiber tends to pull away from the stalk. The presence of stalks in the bowstring stage indicates that retting is well underway. When hemp is short or tangled, or when the ground is too wet for machine, it is bound by hand. A wooden buck is used. Twine will do for tying, but the hemp itself makes a good band. When conditions are favorable, the pickup binder is commonly used. The swaths should lie smooth and even with stalks parallel. The picker won't work well in tangled hemp. After binding, hemp is shocked as soon as possible to stop further retting. In 1942, 14,000 acres of fiber hemp were harvested in the United States. The goal for 1943 is 300,000 acres. Thus, hemp, cannabis sativa, the old standby cordage fiber, is staging a strong comeback. This is Kentucky hemp going into the dryer of a mill at Versailles. In the old days, breaking was done by hand, one of the hardest jobs known to man. Now the power breaker makes quick work of it. Spinning American hemp into rope yarn or twine in the old Kentucky River Mill at Frankfort, Kentucky. Another pioneer plant that has been making cordage for more than a century. presently be turning out products spun from American-grown hemp. Twine of various kinds for tying, winding armatures, and upholsterers work. Rope for marine rigging and towing, for hay forks, derricks, and heavy-duty tackle. Light-duty fire hose. Thread for shoes for millions of American soldiers. and parachute webbing for our paratroopers. As for the United States Navy, every battleship requires 34,000 feet of rope and other craft accordingly. Though here in the Boston Navy Yard, where cables for frigates were made long ago, crews are now working night and day making cordage for the fleet. In the old days, rope yarn was spun by hand. Today, even the rope walk is mechanized. 160 fathoms to go. The rope yarn feeds through holes in an iron plate. This 
is manila hemp from the Navy's rapidly dwindling reserve. When that is gone, American hemp will go on duty again. Hemp for mooring ships. Hemp for tow lines. Hemp for tackle and gear. Hemp for countless naval uses, both on ship and shore. Just as in the days when old Ironside sailed the seas victorious, with her hempen shrouds and hempen sails. Hemp for victory. I received a letter of vital importance from a member of the Narcotics Bureau. I'm going to read this letter to you. My dear Dr. Carroll, the suppression of the use of marijuana and of the forces lurking behind it are the most important jobs this department is now engaged in. At the outset of this letter, there is one vital fact I would like to submit. There is a powerful agency. I speak of the school parent associations of this country which can be invaluable in stamping out this scourge. Their help, their eternal vigilance, could be the deciding factor in our fight against it. The weed marijuana is grown in every state in the Union. Recently, in the city of Brooklyn, New York, a field of marijuana was found behind a tenement court. The weed was here being cultivated, regularly stripped and dried and sold in schools and at government army posts in and around New York. The dried leaves and berries are ground up and made into cigarettes by a simple hand machine. The deadly narcotic is thus quickly and easily prepared for its market. The sale of marijuana is even more difficult to detect and halt than the traffic in drugs such as opium, morphine, and heroin. They are hidden in fake jewelry cases in the heels of shoes, women's shoes especially, because the drugs can be secreted in false heels. Hollow shaving shears are another medium. Books with false centers are often used. Watch cases are convenient hiding places. The value of drugs thus seized is enormous. Recently, a huge supply of heroin was taken. It was concealed in an apparently harmless shipment of 35 barrels of olive oil. The deadly drug was burned in the incinerator of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. And more vicious, more deadly, even than these soul-destroying drugs, is the menace of marijuana. No doubt many of you do not believe that these things do happen, but they cannot happen to you. You may also believe that the facts have been exaggerated. Let me tell you what... The Library of Congress themselves has accepted these movies, or has recommended acceptance, as you can see in the letter, from the assistant chief of the MBRS division, Gift of Video Cassettes. His name is Paul C. Spear, S-P-E-H-R. And uh, he says two half-inch video cassettes were brought to the MBERS division on Friday, May 19th, 1989, their bearer, Jack Herr Hemp. Pack California Marijuana Initiative, Van Eyes, California, of the Help Eliminate Marijuana Prohibition Hemp Pack Political Action Committee, wishes to donate the tapes to the library's c collections. He spoke with Ms. Catherine Longney. The tapes are duplicate. Each contains the following. Hemp, hemp for Victory, produced in 1942 by the United States Department of Agriculture, 14 minutes, and Reefer Madness excerpts, produced in 1936, originally 16, 
seven minutes, but this material is excerpts only. I recommend that we accept them. And that's from uh, Paul C. Spear, assistant chief of that gift division of the uh, motion pictures and film strips. Now I'd like to ask you to send $20 to the Help Eliminate Marijuana Prohibition Hemp Pack, 5632 Van Nuys Boulevard, Van Nuys, California, Suite 210, Zip 91401, Van Nuys, California. Our phone number is 818-377-5886. And we'd like you to know that we'll send you a copy of Hemp for Victory with all the documentation you saw, as well as a copy of the book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes. And please use this information. Send away for more of this information. If you'd like one of our t-shirts, they're $12. They're the Hemp for Victory t-shirt. And um, we have new t-shirts coming out all the time. What we want you to do is, is support normal, support hemp, and get this information around. Uh, we're really a grassroots organization, but we have one big message, and that is that your government, for whatever its reasons, lied about the number one product probably on earth for paper, fiber, fuel, and food. Whether it did it at a conscious level or unconscious level, they've been sending people hundreds and hundreds of thousands to prison and taking away their, their property, their children, their cars, for marijuana. That in any sane society, they would reward people for using in comparison to alcohol and tobacco. The national drug control strategy proposed by President Bush and drug czar Bennett isn't worth the environmentally disastrous and unnecessary sulfuric acid and dioxin-laced wood pulp processed paper which it is printed on. Specifically, the continued prohibition of hemp marijuana cultivation prevents our society from utilizing nature's premier renewable resource for the majority of Earth's paper, fiber, fuel, food, paint, and medicine. Ironically, at the time of George Washington, he and all American farmers were required to grow and could even pay their taxes with hemp. Why? Because hemp was the used for the majority of colonial Americas in the world's paper, clothing, towels, diapers, lace, sails, canvas, Dutch pronunciation of cannabis, rope, paint, varnish, lighting oil, and more. In fact, as recently as World War II, with Philippine and Asian hemp cut off by the Japanese, the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1942 produced a 14-minute black-and-white film, Hemp for Victory, encouraging and instructing patriotic American farmers to grow 350,000 acres of hemp per year by 1943 to be used for civilian and military shoes, rope, fire hoses. Even the parachute webbing that George Bush held onto when he bailed out over the Pacific was made from cannabis hemp. Hemp uses the sun more efficiently than virtually any other plant on our planet. In fact, on a planet-wide, climate-wide, and soil-wide basis, hemp, grown annually, would produce approximately 40 times the biomass that is living organic matter of the next best annual rival biomass crops that be can be grown on Earth, such as corn, kunuf, and sugarcane. Today, we have the ability and the mechanized technology to use hemp biomass and other biomasses for energy farming and produce all of the clean, renewable fuel we would need for all of our cars, homes, and industry with a net reduction of carbon dioxide. Theoretical computer models have shown that reversing the greenhouse effect will only be possible, if possible at all, if hemp and other biomass wastes are used again as they were until 130 years ago for making the overall majority of Earth's paper, fiber, fuels, paints, varnish, and now everything from plastics to dynamite. As for marijuana, 
the blossom of the hemp plant, U.S. government clinical studies as well as studies of the Jamaican, Costa Rican, and Greek marijuana using populations indicate statistically that you will live more than a year longer if you smoke marijuana every day than if you use no drugs at all and 8 to 24 years longer than regular tobacco and alcohol users. In 1987, U.S. government statistics reported 395,000 Americans died from tobacco. 87% of all lung cancer cases were caused by tobacco use. Also, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, that's NIDA, reports 125,000 Americans died in 1987 from alcohol use. That same agency and the Surgeon General's mortality statistics report zero, Z-E-R-O deaths ever due to marijuana. And as of October 1988, no case of lung cancer has ever been attributed solely to marijuana use. Therefore, we at Hemp are seeking a marijuana hemp armistice, that is an immediate nationwide moratorium on the personal medical and industrial suppression of hemp, and for the President and Congress to immediately appoint a hemp advisory commission to oversee and expedite reintroduction of hemp to American agriculture, business and medicine. Our justifications for this moratorium and commission are that with few exceptions, none of the American public, especially our politicians, who should have known when they made these laws, the judges who should have known when they enforced them, and the police, and even the teachers who should have taught them and all the rest of us in the first place, knew virtually any of the preceding history, facts, information, or the vast potential of hemp as Earth's premier natural renewable resource, biomass, and life extender. But if I have to go to jail for fighting for that, or give of any other part, or you should, you should be proud to. I mean, such a sweet thing as marijuana to go to jail for, put there by people that don't even know this information, haven't the foggiest idea, and yet chemicals, petrochemicals, Fossil fuels are totally legal, and hemp, one of the greatest things that we, if not the greatest natural growing thing on earth, is illegal. Every damn politician out there be, should be ashamed of themselves forever if they continue this now that they know this. Or they, and don't check it out if they've heard it and they don't believe it, check it out. But if it's true, you better change your ways, because if a world would accept you, I wouldn't want to live in that world. And if the world doesn't accept you, you should, you should be proud of a world that would teach you how to behave like a adults like you want kids to behave like to be responsible to control their uses we expect you to control the abuses of the power of legislating stupidity ignorance and the end of my planet that's all